great places. This is the part of the program where I get to tell you what it's like out in the field right now for this year's election cycle. What's the highest race we've got? Governor of Maine. We've never before elected an out governor in the history of the United States, and we are poised to do it for the first time ever in a three-way race that will remove a Republican anti-gay incumbent and will we'll replace him with current Congressman Mike Michaud of Maine. goes and sits at the National Governors Association and has a conversation. Same thing happened with Mayor Parker. She goes and sits at the Council of Mayors and the Lincoln Cities. They have lots to talk about. And in her case, they did it locally, talking about her victory in Texas. But the first governor, huge deal. Next, we've never elected an out attorney general in the history of the United States. And Mara Healy in Massachusetts is currently leading by 15 points in the Democratic primary, which is this coming Tuesday, our last primary of the season. There's a very good chance she'll win. And if she wins that primary, there's a very good chance she goes on to the general election and becomes the nation's first out attorney general. And I don't need to tell you why I think an attorney general in any state is good for our community. running for office this year. What happens in the majority of the races is that they don't get quite the same amount of attention. Because they're not these high profile races for mayor, like David Catania running for mayor of the District of Columbia. Imagine that the mayor of Washington, D.C. is gay, and every member of Congress has to come through that mayor's office, that city, to do their work. It's kind of a cool thing. Can't you just bash the city anymore because you know your garbage might not get picked up. <laughs> Mayors have a lot of power, as you know, in Chicago. There are a lot of things that may not happen without a mayor taking care of business. There are certain blocks in Washington which you won't want to visit. They will smell. So, but we mentioned Ray mentioned the idea of state legislatures, right? So we know that in every state legislature in the country where we start electing a caucus of LGBT leaders, we see progress. We see dramatic changes. Nearby, in the Midwest, we have a chance to elect our first two, not our first two, but our, there's nobody in the legislature today in Michigan. And we have an opportunity now for you to hear from Jeremy Moss and John Hope who are poised to enter the Michigan legislature after this general election. I hope you'll join us with a warm welcome and invite them up here to speak to you about what it's like to run for office, to have Victor's endorsement and support, and how you have helped get them to this point. Please welcome Jeremy and John. of one term um, where Republicans serve, we've sent two Democrats to the U.S. Senate for the past 35 years. And Detroit, where I was born, is one of the strongest Democratic strongholds of any major American city. Uh, but John and I are here to give you a little bit of the dose of reality that we face as gay Michiganders. Michigan has some of the most restricted anti-LGBT laws in the country. Marriage equality is unconstitutional. When a federal judge lifted the ban, our governor and attorney general filed for and were granted an emergency stay on that decision, ending marriage equality after a matter of hours and 323 marriages. Now, put this into perspective. Last month, Metro Detroit was ravaged by flooding throughout the region. 
And the governor waited several days to declare a state of emergency in Metro Detroit. But when he uh, was faced with the opportunity of supporting an emergency stay on a federal judge's ruling to, that declared our ban on same-sex marriage on, on, on unconstitutional, he uh, put that emergency stay in a matter of hours because, you know, priorities. So. <laughs> but our restricted rights in, in, in Michigan go beyond the ban on marriage equality. I mean, of course, civil unions are unconstitutional. Our state, it is legal to fire someone for being LG, B, or T, or if you're perceived just to be gay or transgender. In fact, our Civil Service Commission, which is a nonpartisan, non-legislative body, took the step of offering same-sex partnership benefits to state employees. But immediately, our legislature that was at the time Republican-controlled stepped forward and said, we can't afford to grant, quote, roommate benefits. But you know that if there was similar straight couples that all got married the next day, the money would have been found. Yeah, so how did a blue state like Michigan get to this situation? It's because for too long we haven't had a voice in that discussion. Uh, before John and I, as has been mentioned, there's only been one openly gay state legislator in Michigan's history, and he was term limited seven years ago. Uh, so when you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I know we're painting this dark picture uh, for the LGBT community in Michigan, but based on August's primary election results in Michigan, it could actually get worse. I mean, Jeremy and I were excited to win our primary and have an opportunity to really advance our community's voice in the legislature. But at the same time that we were winning in our primaries, there was other folks who won as well. For example, there's a gentleman named Lee Chatfield who was running against an incumbent moderate, pro-equality, sort of next-generation Republican. And he ended up beating Mr. Frank Foster, and he ran because he specifically cited that Frank Foster supported non-discrimination protections. And in Michigan, and I'm going to say this name, and I think a lot of Michigan folks know him, we also have Gary Glenn. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Glenn, you know, he's the head of the American Family Association of Michigan, which the Southern Poverty Law Center has defined as a hate group. He is the author of our 2004 Marriage and Everything Else ban, and in fact, he is so out of the mainstream that the Great Lakes Education Project, which is a conservative um, organization, actually sent out mailers to Republicans in the district that said, quote, buyer beware, radical beliefs. Glenn believes the government should be able to police your bedrooms, imprison all gay citizens, and has publicly endorsed essays by white supremacists. And that's from his friends, <laughs> right? These are the folks that we could be serving with. So even though we're winning in the court of public opinion, even though we are winning ballot measures and democratic primaries, we have to be vigilant because there are the Lee Chatfields and the Gary Glens of the world that are actively trying to slow our progress. And that's why the work of the Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund is so critical in Michigan. There's no doubt that John and I were successful in our primary races due to, 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 in part to the support from Victory Fund. And John and I hail from strong Democratic districts and are very likely to win our seats in November, barring a major scandal like getting caught in bed with a married woman or, or a woman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, during my campaign, uh, Victory Fund provided me a lot of personal growth as a candidate for office. Like many people, when I first accepted I was gay and started to come out, I said to myself, I'm gay, and this is awful. What is my life going to become? Uh, what's going to happen to me? And then eventually turned into, I'm gay, and I, I can tolerate this, which soon enough became, I'm gay, and that's okay. Uh, and by the time that I was elected in 2011 as the youngest ever member of the Southfield City Council, which is a major Detroit suburb, I was gay, and I was happy. Um, Victory Fund's support for my campaign took that sense of self uh, one step further. I'm gay, and that's important. I'm gay, and I can affect change in Michigan because of it. And because of Victory Fund's support, donors across this country, uh, including some in this room, invested in my campaign because I was a gay candidate. I earned votes because I was a gay candidate. Uh, and that's no more evident than the story from uh, our August 5th primary election. Um, while staff from Victory Fund was on the ground that Tuesday in my district making phone calls, 
And John will talk a little bit more about the tactical support we received from Victory Fund uh, throughout our campaigns. I was venturing from polling site to polling site, uh, as any strategic candidate should not do on primary day, but any crazy candidate will absolutely do on primary election day. Um, so I was at Stevenson Elementary talking to voters arriving at the poll, along with one of my opponent's sister. And she was handing out flyers for her brother. And that afternoon, a little old lady wearing a Detroit Central High t-shirt walks up, and she gives a huge hug to my opponent's sister. Apparently they were former colleagues at the high school, and they're catching up on this and that. And I'm kind of, you know, standing there watching this overblown reunion of sorts, thinking, well, shit. I didn't know <laughs> So then she comes up to me after she's done talking to my opponent's sister, uh, and in front of her says, you know, Jerry, I watch you on TV on the council meetings. I think your work is great. You absolutely have my vote. And she's about to walk into the polling site, and she turns around to me and says, and another thing, LGBT, and gives me a fist bump and goes <laughs> Jeremy's right. The, there's a quality of affirmation that's critical to the visibility of our community um, and the sanity of candidates like us. But there's also the nuts and bolts value of an endorsement from the Victory Fund. You know, from the largest campaigns to the smallest, every campaign needs people power, we need financial resources, and you know, we oftentimes need another set of eyes to help give us the best advice. You know, and Victory Fund goes beyond an endorsement and a check. Uh, and provides that tactical support that so many candidates need. Coming into the final Get Out the Vote weekend for my campaign, um, we had already done, you know, I think 24,000 door knocks. We had done 20,000 phone calls. Uh, and, you know, we were really excited about, about the final few days. And then Jason Burns, who had been a voice on the phone and a steadfast part of our campaign for every other week since the beginning of the year, showed up. Right? It wasn't just the advice, but took the time to be there. And then he worked with my staff and my interns and our volunteers to make sure that everybody felt welcome and excited and trained up for that last weekend. And we were able to increase our voter contact and knock on something like over a thousand doors a day for the last five days of that campaign. And that's because of the support from the folks like the Victory Fund. Now, the help that the Victory Fund provides is going to be different for every candidate. You know, some campaigns need things like uh, to help design a mail piece or literature. Other campaigns are going to need things like coaching on financial support or contributions from those campaign board, victory campaign board members. And other, thing, other folks are going to need public speaking help and strategy. But what remains is this. The Victory Fund is a one-stop campaign shop to help our campaign and our communities increase our visibility at every level of the political process and make sure that we are out to win. But they cannot help candidates like us unless you help them. So now we get to do my favorite part, which is we're going to ask you to donate. So super excited. All right. Now here's the good news. We've been told that there is an anonymous donor who has very generously uh, put forth a match for today. And it's right around $25,000. So whatever we give today on these pledge cards, which I think you all have in front of you, it will be matched dollar for dollar up to 25000 So we want to make sure we take full advantage of this, and we're not going to leave any money on the table. So my first question is, can someone here just write a check for $25,000? Maybe? All right. Good try. It's only never to ask, right? All right. But we're going to do this now and say, is there someone here who could make, and let's be a little more reasonable, who could make a $5,000 contribution to the Victory Fund? All right. Oh my gosh. All right. How about $2,500? Who here can do $2,500? It'll include a date with John Oakley. <laughs> you have to ask my partner about that. <laughs> what about $1,500? Who can make a $1,500 donation today? That comes out to be about $125 a month. And if you come out on the monthly, we got a yes. We got yes. All right. Can I say another one? 
know, we got this spotlight here. Listen, I love raising money, so I can stand up here all day asking for <laughs> Don't you worry about that. 